today's lecture, what you'll find is that for mycobacterium, really your focus is more on not so much like individual diseases and what they do, it's more or less like how do you identify them in the lab and like what's important um, physically about the bacteria, okay, versus like disease and infection type of thing. And then the mycoplasms, they're pretty straightforward. That wasn't a long lecture at all, okay, if you guys have already looked at that. Um, okay, so for some of these, these are sort of the most important things that aren't necessarily listed in your PowerPoint. So for the first one with mycoplasm, they're going to be characterized by no cell wall, which would mean what kind of stain would you have to do? Mm -hmm. Acid best stain. And then for your most significant, meaning infection-wise, here are your three right here. So M. pneumoniae, anybody know about this one? Anything about this one? It's pretty interesting. Walking walking pneumonia. It's walking pneumonia, exactly where most people are walking around for weeks at a time and don't realize that they actually have it until they start feeling crappy and then it's like, oh, you have pneumonia. That's a deal. Okay? Um, community acquired is another big thing for that one. Okay? And then hominis and urea plasma are going to be genital mycoplasms. Okay? And with these guys, they're going to do them by culture and then also now PCR is becoming available for these as well. So that would be diagnosis-wise, okay? But that's really your general information for that section, okay? Um, mycobacterium, on the other hand, when you're talking about that, historically you're talking about agents of TB and other chronic lung infections. You always think of lung when you hear that word, okay? And then they're divided into two groups. You have MTBC and NTM. For these guys, the first group, these are all significant and they're all capable of causing TB, which is the difference with these. With the NTM, you're talking about pulmonary infections, but typically it's going to affect those that have a predisposing factor. A lot of times what comes to mind is like AIDS patients, um, HIV, that type of thing. So the predisposing factor is going to sort of be a big uh, topic here, okay? Another interesting thing is that there's a bunch of variable temperatures for these, and it depends on which type of organism it is. So you see here you have skin species and the temperature that it prefers, and then you have environmental contaminants and internal organs, what it prefers. So you guys will have to know that for the test for sure, okay? And that what uh, three different areas that they're broken up into, okay? The other thing that's pretty funky is that the culture plates, check it out, are generally incubated for eight to 10 weeks before growth is reported as negative. That's such a long time. And you'll find out with these guys too, it takes forever to get them to grow as well. So it's a big problem in the lab. Um, and of course, it's important to know the site of infection, obviously, to know where you're gonna incubate it and what's the optimal temperature whether it's a skin or versus the internal. The other thing that they do besides the variable temperatures is they'll do pigment production. Um, they're gonna determine this through an assay and you have three different types. You guys can read the different ones, the photo to the non, which would be no pigmentation whatsoever, okay? Um, but that's another way that they can characterize these as well is on pigmentation, okay? All right, mycoplasms. Those are your objectives up there. Okay, there's a picture of a mycoplasma right there, a circular. Um, are those intracellular mycoplasmas? I know the mycobacteria. Yeah, these aren't really considered like that, um, although they do look like that. Okay, all right. Um, this is just your list of general characteristics right here. Um, again, the no cell wall thing is pretty important. And here's another problem is that they're pleomorphic. So obviously, like a gram stain is not going to work for a variety of reasons. Um, slow growing, um, <clears throat> excuse me, complex media containing cholesterol and fatty acids for growth. However, you have pneumonia and hominis is an exception to that. For example, um, hominis can grow in BAP and chocolate, okay, without a problem, which is interesting because you know the ingredients for that. It's 
nothing major. And then pneumonia grows in something called PPLO, which is just basically a long <clears throat> name for a type of pneumonia plate. Okay, so those would be the two exceptions right there. And the other thing is mycoplasms, they have what's called a fried egg appearance, and they literally do look like fried eggs, and you can actually get them under a microscope. Okay? Um, let's see. Clinical infections. These are your two that we're talking about is pneumonia and hominis. And then you have a couple other minor mycoplasm species, but we don't really spend a lot of time on this. Um, for pneumonia, you guys saw this is walking pneumonia, or they call it primary atypical pneumonia. And one of the things I wanted to mention is how it differs from streptococcus pneumonia, okay? So for this guy, it's a lot more milder than streptococcus. The infection is milder. And there's a higher incidence in this in young adults. And it's also not seasonal, like streptococcus pneumonia is as well. Okay, so there's a three different ways to sort of differentiate it besides, you know, doing your tests and your stinging. So it's a lot milder, uh, milder not seasonal, yeah. Higher incidence in young adults and not seasonal. Okay? Okay, and I just mentioned walking pneumonia. Here it is on here, Mercer, if you just want to highlight the slide. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, the other thing is, uh, Closed-in populations are at risk, so people uh, like in jails, prisoners, or even like um, students staying in dorm rooms, that type of thing, are going to be higher at risk for mycoplasma pneumonia than others. Um, incubation two to three weeks and early symptoms are non-specific, which is why a lot of people are walking around and don't really know that they even have it. Okay. Um, also, it's listed as a co-infection or co-factor in meningococcal meningococcal. Oh my god, I can never say this, but I'm like tired. Um, Lauren? Hi. Meningitis, thank you. I got it myself. <laughs> um, there we go. Okay. So, two to three weeks is important on this one, okay, versus your shock and pneumonia. So, not much to know about this. Um, the thing that I may ask you for pneumonia versus hominis is to sort of compare and contrast them in a short answer, okay? Obviously, the site of infection is going to be way different since this is in the genital tract. Um, however, what's interesting is that this one also is frequently isolated from asymptomatic individuals, okay? Which makes them difficult to positively culture because there's not really infections going on. Um, they're also considered opportunistic, and they're going to be found in the lower GI tracts, or GU tracts, excuse me, of 50% of healthy adults. And then it's also reported as a cause of non gonococcal urethritis, okay, or NGU. So another problem is it can be transmitted to the fetus at delivery, okay, and if it is, they recover this via CSF of the newborn if it's transmitted, okay? That's how they would figure that out. Um, so body fluids, a variety of body fluids that you can mycoplasm culture. Um, you can also do tissue samples. But the thing to remember is that they're going to be very sensitive to drying and to heat, which will also be something that would be hit on on the test, okay? So ideally, specimens should be inoculated bedside. And then if you look at the next one, that's important too about the cotton swabs. They don't really like that, okay, because of inhibitory effects. And here's another one that is very interesting, because I don't think we've come across one yet that you've actually had to put in the freezer. So specimens should be frozen at minus 70 C um, if immediate plating is not possible within 24 hours, okay? So that point right there is very important as well. So you might want to highlight that perhaps. I'm sure I'll ask you about what temperature it should be that, okay? Oh, thank God. I was like getting so strung out here that the next slide isn't going to have anything on it either. Um, okay, culture-wise, you have something called SP4 broth and auger that goes with it, okay, for the culture of mycoplasms. Um, specifically, M. hominis is going to require arginine, um, and obviously it's not going to be visible by gram stain. 
However, they can use DNA fluorescent staining, which would be okay. And then there's something called A8 auger that can be used to recover that organism as well. Um, the other thing is there's actually commercial kits that are floating around, but they're available in Europe, but we don't have them in the United States for some reason right now. Okay, so there are commercial kits that can do this as well. So for isolation and identification, um, let's see. Solid auger, let's look at that one. Incubated in environmental environment of room air enhanced five to ten percent CO2. Okay? Here's the problem again that I was talking about before. Hominis colonies are gonna appear within two to four days, so that's typical, not a big deal. But pneumonia colonies can take up to twenty-one days or more. So that's a huge problem right there. Um, and then of course Know what it can be stained with. You have two options on this slide, so know both of them for staining purposes, okay? And then you also have serological diagnosis. So you have serum samples that can be submitted. Um, cold agglutination antibody titer is like your go-to for atypical pneumonia. Um, however, they've been seeing that it is, it is non-specific. So that was like the standard way back when but now they're seeing that they're not getting such good results with that, okay? Um, interpretation, um, let's see. Know the first one for sure, that you're gonna consider them a significant and it's gonna be pathogenic, okay? And again, this is coming up again as a second time, all respiratory specimens should be stored at minus 70. Yeah, so that's very important. 